Simulation Nation is presented by Avkin Incorporated, your one-stop shop for wearable simulators and everything standardized patient. Nation podcast. So I am so excited for this topic today. I think that this one is so interesting. Amy, you go around and kind of share this as one of your main keynotes that you present on. And the part that I love about it is one, I was there for most of it. So again, (laughs) watching it from a very different perspective, but also I think that it just goes to the heart of why Avkin was created, Mm -hmm. why we do what we do. And I think you say it all the time of you're the most unlikely CEO and things along those lines. And I don't always agree with that particularly, but I do think that it just shows such a natural progression of how we started a company, right? It was never that we went into it with that mindset. No, for sure. It definitely was not not ever on the bucket list. And that's why I say that I'm an unlikely CEO because it was never something that I aspired to, but because um, I was so passionate about what we were doing and believed so strongly in the advances that we were making in simulation education, I was, I didn't have a choice Yeah, but you are entrepreneurial when I think that that's the difference is we, it took us a little while, but I do remember me and Amy Buka at one point were there together. Amy Buka is our COO, um, also been with the company from the very start, but we sat down and we were like, wait, when she was a kid, she was collecting acorns and selling them at craft acorns. that's what it was wasn't it no i made um little sachets so we no it was the little owl thing oh no then that you're talking about that with that was the walnuts oh walnuts. walnuts but you collected those and then sold those at art fairs with your mom you started a catering company and we're doing catering yeah, for a long period of time mm-hmm. and i mean again it's not as if it's not as if you started a company in your past, but it was like you did a lot of these endeavors of kind of like, I mean, again, when I was a child, we had a cookie company making thing where, again, we would sell cookies at Christmas to make money. So it was just like one of those like. Yeah, we just didn't have a lot of money. So you're entrepreneurial when you don't have a lot of money. But, that's I, don't sure. think, but I think that, too, it's a personality. I do think it takes a certain yeah, personality maybe. that's like, yeah, all right, we're, I'm going to do a catering thing and I'm going to do this and I'm going to try this out because, you know. Yeah. Again, not that it's the same, but I do think that there is an element there that you've always yeah. had that. I mean, it's my personality, so I, I really yes. don't know any different. So. Yes, but I think that that's yeah. a valid point okay. that doesn't talked about a lot. But I just want you to kind of just go back and share the start of everything and kind of like when Avkin originated as a concept and as an idea and kind of how you got started with that because our theme for today is basically how do you achieve radical change when it feels like your hands are tied and I think so many simulationists feel that way but we don't they don't feel like there's an option they don't feel like they know where to go next or where to where to operate next and for you you really saw an opportunity and then continue to push past what was in front of you. Yeah. Um, so the achieving radical change when it feels like your hands are tied, um, that actually is the title of my very first keynote speech at an Axel 2016 when um, I received the Hayden Vanguard Award. And I think, you know, when they when they asked me to present, they said, just tell your story. And from that perspective, for me, the idea of achieving radical change when you feel like your hands are tied is exactly <laughs> what it felt like to go on that journey. Mm -hmm. And the journey for the company started way, way, way before we ever got our business license. It started, it probably, well, it all started officially in 2006 when I was hired to take over the skills and the skills lab at at the university, but also then to start up their simulation program. Mm -hmm. And so I quickly got started on, you know, I came right out of the emergency department It was right on the heels of a hurricane, and my ER colleague said, when you go there to to do this, make sure they know what the heck they're doing Mm -hmm. uh, before they graduate. And Mm -hmm. I think that it was from experiences that that the student, they struggled with new graduates or even students that were in their upper levels of, you know, really knowing their stuff. And I know for me personally, I struggled as as a new graduate um, entering the floor. And so I really felt very strongly that 
simulation could be this bridge of helping people from what they learned in the classroom and then going into actual clinical practice mm -hmm. and helping them do better. I mean, it really went there for an altruistic purpose. So, so when they I had told you after Hurricane Katrina that yes, basically there was a, need mm -hmm. for disaster training or I guess we didn't really know it was simulation at the time, but a need for simulation training and education. Yeah, well, it, I mean, so it, it came from a couple of different people. So the, there, yes, it was immediately after Katrina when the National Guard was sent down there, um, and they had some interactions with some newly graduated nurses that were very, you know, I mean, again, it's it's emotionally very difficult. Yeah. This is a very difficult thing, um, but it is a fact of life that disasters happen, and mm -hmm. um, nurses could be called in at any point in time, mm -hmm. and, you know, we... There's a lot that happened at Katrina that really impacted the healthcare, especially down in New Orleans. Yeah. But um, she came back and just said, you know, hey, these guys need to be better prepared. Make sure you're doing everything you can. And of course, we did do disaster drills as a result mm -hmm. of that. But then I also had other um, colleagues that worked in the ER with me that were also school nurses that had the um, senior students that, mm -hmm. you know, said that they, they just struggle a little bit with how to, you know, communicate with their pediatric people within the school system and also just, you know, being able to put all of the pieces together. It's really hard. It's yeah. a, critical thinking and critical judgment. It's not it's not just words. And yeah. it's it's different with every single patient. It's not as if every heart attack patient you do the exact same thing. Now there are protocols and things like that, but but that person why they are having that particular, you know, ailment, it's different. Yeah. So you know, for me, it was a very strong calling um, to not just do my job, but to really make sure that these students were prepared uh, for what they were going to face in clinical practice mm -hmm. and that they were as competent as I could possibly make them. And I really was kind of like the one-stop shop in adult health. I didn't do anything with pediatrics mm -hmm. or with maternity, mm -hmm. but I did have a lot of um, a lot of opportunity within uh, the adult health realm of mm -hmm. what we could possibly do. And so at that time, what were you incorporating? Because, again, it was still so early in terms of simulation, right? We didn't have steering to best practice. There weren't all of these no. resources out there. So at the time, what were you using? Well, they had just purchased two um, – mannequins mm -hmm. um, that, you know, blinked and had heartbeats and, mm -hmm. and all of those things. Mm -hmm. um, and they, so that's what we were using. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there was no such thing as a control room back then. Mm -hmm. As you said, there was no such thing as standards of best practice. But I was able to um, utilize the mannequins. I had to go and learn how to program them. And Today's mannequins are much easier to operate than they were back in the day, mm -hmm. but um, we got to do some simulations with them. But, but what it was really hard because mm -hmm. there's so much to a person than just their physiology, mm -hmm. um, and there's so much more to a person than just their, you know, what's on their chart. And so, trying to create that that additional piece of the communication and the the patient to nurse connection and the the you know, the, the fact that people are so much more complex than just their diagnoses. Yeah. It's so much deeper than that. It is. And so I, I thought, well, look, I can do, I'm an ER nurse. I can do a CPR simulation. Mm -hmm. So the patient has expired. We're good. Let's mm -hmm. just, let's just do, do that because that was one of the courses. It was in one of the courses. And so, you know, they have to learn how to use the code card and, you know, all those things. So we, <clears throat> we also included the idea of post-mortem care mm -hmm. in that simulation because, again, it, you know, it, th there's only so much that they could do as mm -hmm. far as, um, uh, the, you know, we want them to practice CPR, we want them to practice ventilations, we want them to practice code cart medication administration. So, um, you know, so I thought, well, let's, let's start doing a si CPR simulation because obviously they're unconscious, it mm -hmm. doesn't re require that human-to-human -human connection. Um, and incorporated within that CPR scenario um, wasn't just ventilations and, you know, uh, compressions and things like that. But it was also um, post-mortem care. Mm -hmm. So it just added a little bit more to it, and it um, was incorporated into a, a part of our competencies. So we were doing one particular CPR simulation that was very memorable to me. Um, and I was now in the control room. Mm -hmm. We were It was far enough along. I think it was a 2000 and nine uh 2000 yeah about 2009 and um the 
the code was called overhead. So from the control room, I call in and say the patient's expired and at such and such a time. And the nursing student that was doing the compression smacked her hands down on the mannequin, put them together and said, that's it, you're dead, I'm done. And from the control room, I was literally in shock. I'm glad they couldn't see my face. Yeah. I'm glad that I wasn't in the room for that yeah. one because I was shocked. And it, my thought process was, that's somebody's father. Mm-hmm. That's somebody's husband. Mm-hmm. That's actually a federal offense, mm-hmm. you know? And so how do we convey the humanity mm-hmm. even when somebody has passed? Mm-hmm. And how do we create that that patient-nurse relationship Yeah. And have them understand. Yeah. I actually was even concerned that that might translate into patient care if yeah. they weren't treating the mannequin well. Now, during the debriefing, we had a conversation. Yeah. And, you know, she said she wasn't thinking about it as a human. Mm-hmm. Again, I, it concerned me. Yeah. I was very concerned. And it yeah. was kind of a defining moment that though I had these mannequins and I'd been doing Again, attempting to find some value in doing these simulation experiences, um, pulling out as many objectives as I possibly could, it only taught them half of what they needed to know. Yeah. And that's really, for me, I thought, we need to have live people. Even in that situation that I just described, even if there is a, you know, a couple of family members in the room, that's going to change the game. Mm-hmm. It's going to make everything feel as though that is a real person yeah, and that that is a life and that needs to be respected. And so yeah. from my perspective, that's really where things changed of me really focusing on standardized patients. Again, mm-hmm. at the time, I didn't know what they were called yeah, um, and I didn't know how to find help. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was my hands being tied. Yeah. You know, I knew what I wanted. I knew what I wanted to see, but I didn't know how to get there. Yeah, And so I felt as though, how do I get how do I make change when my hands are tied? Yeah. I don't have resources. I don't even know what these things are called. I don't yeah. even know. Well, there wasn't even a term at that point of Well, there was in the medical it. world, but not mm-hmm. in the nursing world. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, I read on a listserv mm-hmm. that somebody had had some theater students come over to help them. Mm-hmm. And I thought, oh, that's a great idea. Let me call the theater department. And I called several you know, semesters in a row, um, and I didn't get anywhere. Mm-hmm. And then finally through a connection with physical therapy because we were going to start doing the interprofessional simulation together. Um, they knew someone from the theater department. And then not only did they send us theater students, but they came with them. Mm-hmm. And I think that really was key. So they brought theater professors. The theater professor came with the students. Mm-hmm. So, the, you know, they really kind of, again, at the time I didn't know but they were really acting kind of in a director or a coach role Mm -hmm. for those standardized patients. Or a standardized patient educator that we now would refer to as. Yes, yes, yes. But at the time, we didn't have those words. (laughs) We didn't have those terms. But that's really where, um, you know, things got started. And it was just super exciting to see simulations come to life. Yeah. So that first time that you were able to kind of see that collaboration happen between you know, nursing and those theater students, like, can you explain that first day of simulation? Well, I mean, I think that from my, from the perspective of, you know, the nursing educator, it was everything I wanted in a simulation experience. Mm -hmm. It was every, it was nursing students and physical therapy students working together to take care of a traumatic brain injured patient and ambulate them to the door and back again. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's a simple simulation, right? Mm-hmm. There's not a lot of, you know, physiologic changes. Mm-hmm. But those students had to w- learn to work together to communicate and f- with a patient who had a traumatic brain injury, communicate with each other, mm-hmm. and coordinate that ambulation. And, and what we found that first semester that we did it is that that the physical therapy students needed to carry gate belts with them at all times because Mm -hmm. the gate belt was in the room Mm -hmm. and they could use it, but they were not looking at their environment and they didn't see the gate belt. And so, again, if they were not stabilizing the patient correctly, the patient through the theater department was taught to fall safely, Mm -hmm. just like they do in theater. Mm -hmm. Um, And the nursing students and physical therapy students, again, had to troubleshoot 
during that simulation. So from that sem semester forward, then PT walked in and they had a gate belt wrapped around their shoulder because they realize that they don't always look for the, in their environment for mm -hmm. the solution to what they need. So, you know, after that very first day, mm -hmm. um, and we did two weeks of simulations, mm -hmm. um, and it was just basically because it was it was hard to schedule physical therapy and nursing, so we did them earlier in the morning or yeah. later in the afternoon because courses didn't always align, which is commonly a problem. But I remember walking out to, the, to my car probably about 6.30 in the evening, and I was so happy. Again, the evaluations were off the charts. Mm -hmm. um, the, the SPs gave, again, at the time they weren't called that, but um, they gave great evaluations. And it felt like it was really working. Mm -hmm. um, but I was so excited. But I remember me looking at my theater partner who we were walking out to the parking lot together. And I said, that was great. That was, this is exactly what I wanted. And he said, you know, this is going to become a boiling pot that you're going to have a hard time keeping the lid on. And at the time, I literally had no idea what he's talking about. I'm like, what? This is just really cool simulations. Can mm -hmm. we do it again next semester? Yeah. Right? But he could foresee, he was foreshadowing what the potential was mm -hmm. with this program. Yeah. And boy, oh boy, did we grow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So from that first semester... We built the program, and we were doing a lot of simulations. I think at that time we were probably doing about 235 hours of, of wow. SP yeah. simulations, mm -hmm. and we loved it. I loved every minute of it. Yeah. And at that point, uh, we had worked with our local um, hospital, um, a tertiary care hospital, and we were basically through in partnership with them. So I was able to have a faculty position that was just focused on um, standardized patients mm -hmm. and the methodology behind that. And we had hired someone else to do the majority of the mannequin simulations as well as the skills lab. And, uh, you know, at, the, at, at some point, it was in uh, 2013, the spring of 2013, spring break, the person that they had hired and who had been working there for about a year and a half called over spring break and said, I'm not coming back and you can't make me. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. okay. <laughs> So, you know, we had literally less than a week to figure out what to do. And because the mannequin simulations were so much more complicated because you had to be the voice of the mannequin, you had to, you know, again, know how to get into the programming and um, know how to mark things off and things like that. Uh, I was the only other person that knew how to do it. Yeah. So I was asked to go down and do mannequin simulations Well, the other faculty who you know, didn't, weren't trained on the mannequin, could do the SP simulations. Because it's easier, once the, uh, the SPs are trained, in my opinion, it's easier to do, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And you follow, you know, you're looking at your evaluation form, you're watching the simulation, they're trained, they're ready to go. Yeah. So that first week after the semester started, or started back up after spring break, um, I was doing a tracheostomy simulation. And I had done it before. It was mm -hmm. a patient who was in respiratory distress. They needed to assess the patient mm -hmm. for respiratory distress and suction them. Like, mm -hmm. that was the main objectives of the simulation. Um, the students walked into the room, and they said, Mr. Jones, what's your name and date of birth? And I didn't respond because the patient is nonverbal, typically with a trach, and I wanted them to understand how to communicate with a patient who's nonverbal. They all looked at each other. And I could just tell that they were saying something to each other without saying it. One ran over to the side of the bed that had the pulse on it, which would have been the left arm for this particular mannequin. And they're nervous, so they just occluded the pulse. She said, there's no pulse. And they started doing compressions. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. How do we get to compressions? The patient's just short of breath and needs to be suctioned. And mm -hmm. my thought was, when... when they asked what his name and date of birth was. If I just had a standardized patient who could hold up their arm. Showing the wristband. Showing them yeah. the wristband. Yeah. But they don't, I can't put tracheostomies in my patients. I can't, or my standardized patients. I can't yeah. say, hey, just going to put a little cut here in your yeah. trachea. Um, no big deal. Like, yeah. I would get fired from my job. Yeah. So the idea was, well, how can I solve that problem? How can I fix this yeah. to make it so much more realistic? Yeah. And I thought of the idea of creating a wearable simulator. Again, at the time, I had no idea that's what it yeah. was, but just something that could go on top of my standardized patients. To so, make them sicker. To make them sicker and to add pathology, but also with there was limitations with the mannequins that, that I wanted to fix. Like, mm -hmm. could they actually put mucus mm -hmm. in the trachea? Because yeah. that's we got to suction that out. And yeah. 
there's never a good way to do that. Even in skills lab, there's yeah. not a good way to teach it. Um, I wanted them to be able to hear lung sounds. The, the masking of the chest rising up and down with the mannequins is hard yeah. because because they're trying to figure out whether it's the, the compression of the, the compressor going off to rise and fall the chest, um, the mechanism behind that, or if it's actual lung sounds. You, yeah. There's just no way to do it any other way. Mm -hmm. um, but I, So I wanted realistic and authentic lung sounds and nothing that would compete because they're just learning. They don't know what they're listening for. Yeah. Um, and I also wanted the, the idea or the concept is I wanted the patient to react if the, they hit the carina. Yeah. Um, I hit the carina as a new nurse and I saw the reaction and it scared me. Yeah. I wanted them to know that's really painful for a patient and I wanted them to see it. But I also wanted them to understand that that kind of reaction can happen yeah. even in a semi-comatose patient, which was what I had. Yeah. as a new nurse. And again, I think that it's airway. So it's just naturally always going to be a lot scarier anytime someone is working with airway. And again, that is their only way to yeah. breathe. So yeah. And I didn't know it at the time, but it makes perfect sense that patients with a tracheostomy is the scariest yeah. patient for a new nurse. Yeah. Like it's, it is the number one. Yeah. I'm nervous about this because if they do have a trach, there's only one airway. They don't yeah. have a nose and a mouth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so it is, it is frightening. Yeah. It's very frightening. Yeah. So that, you know, that really began the idea of what can I do? Mm -hmm. Um, I didn't know yeah. who to talk to. I didn't know who to go to. Um, I was told that I needed to contact the engineering department and I, I think I'm a little embarrassed to say they didn't really know who would be creating such an idea or an overlay for me. Um, but we had, because I had found our, my theater partner with, um, collaborating with the PT department, I began reaching out. So we were, um, my theater partner and I were out doing a lunch and learn at the university. And I just said in the, in the audience, hey, I'd love to find an engineering professor who would work with me on creating this solution. And again, at the time, it was a solution for me mm -hmm. in my simulation space with my students mm -hmm. for the SPs that worked mm -hmm. with us, yeah. right? Just something so, cool to have. Just well, and just, cool. yeah. just a solution to a problem, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. How do we how do we make it more realistic and more authentic? And um, they were they everybody shouted out uh, uh, Jenny Buckley, who was the name of the person who uh, ran this program, where um, mechanical engineers, biomedical engineers, and electrical engineers all worked together on a project, small groups. Mm -hmm. um, for um, solving a problem in industry. So students were doing this. Yes. Engineering students. Yes, and mm -hmm. the professor oversaw the, the mm -hmm. program. Um, and I I remember thinking to myself, okay, these are the things that I want. And they, you know, they, they have used terms of what are your wants, what are the constraints, mm -hmm. what are your needs, you know, like all mm -hmm. of that. So it's like very specific terminology. But essentially, I told that I, I, I wanted to put mucus, them to be able to put mucus in the device. And they said, well, electronics and fluids don't mix. And I said, well, you all have 15 weeks to figure this out. Yeah. <laughs> and they were being graded. So they did, which yeah. was great. But um, the cool thing was that with whenever we were creating the next product and the next things, again, it started, it always, it's still to this day, starts off with the senior design project. Um, but because it's not engineers that are employed um, that could say, well, this isn't going to work or we can't do it that way. They have to find creative ways around things. And yeah. so I wasn't willing to compromise the fact that it needed to have mucus in the trachea. Um, and, and But I think that's so, so unique as well in all of this is, again, if you would have gone to an engineering company or you would have been set up, again, you would have been told that's not possible. I'm so sorry we can't do that, right? Yep. And I think that that's the coolest part is that these were students who were then like, we're not going to approach this from a jaded mentality or a mentality of, oh, can't do it or, you know, whatever that may be. They worked with the same open-mindedness of saying, all right, let's find the solution for what that was. And obviously then being able to prove that it can be done, yeah. I think is the part that, again, just really defies what the status quo was at that time of just being able to say, yeah, well, they don't mix. I don't know what to tell you. Yeah. Guess it's just not going to, you're just not going to be able to have that in your simulation, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that was, again, the idea is like, I knew what I wanted. Mm -hmm. I didn't know how to get there. Yeah. Right? My hands were tied. I didn't have thousands of thousands of yeah. dollars to go to an engineering department. Yeah. I didn't even know who to go to. Mm -hmm. But by networking and reaching out and by 
you know, again, appealing to people to, you know, this is what's really important. And by working within the means that I had, we were able to begin to see change. And in 15 weeks, um, I got a prototype. Now, if it's laughable, but when we started, I thought, if you look at the Avtrake now, that's what I thought they were going to hand me at the yeah. end. It wasn't. Yeah. It a very like, beautiful, <laughs> sleek, <laughs> yeah, refined, perfect, done product as if, you know, it was something that was available on the market. But it wasn't. It was. It looked like it was put together with bubble gum and glue. <laughs> but in the end, the, the important part to that is for the very first time, mm -hmm. we could see students interacting with patients who were nonverbal. Yeah. We could see how students reacted to the carina being triggered or the yeah. face plate being triggered because there were sensors inside. Yeah. Right? So those sensors inside create a cell phone vibration that went off, um, you know, on the back of the person that was wearing it, on the back of the standardized patient. So the nursing students didn't see. There was yeah. no, like, trigger for them, but they could see the reaction to, of the patient, and then I, as the instructor, could see the reaction to the reaction, yeah. which was so important. Mm -hmm. Some of them would break sterile procedure, which is what I did as a new nurse, right? Mm -hmm. Some of them would grab the oxygen and put the oxygen back on the patient, which is exactly what they should have done. So being able to not just see the actual technique for the procedure, but being able to see how they did, what, what did they do as far as cl critical thinking and clinical judgment in the moment that that was happening. Yeah. And I think that to me that was so transformational yeah. that all of a sudden not only was it about the communication, the patient to patient connection and about being able to actually do the procedure and hear the lung sounds properly, it was also about being able to see their critical thinking and clinical judgment come to life. Yeah. In a, in a very stressful that, uh, environment. It unlocks a new level of simulation because I feel like historically it's always been, well you can see the skill, you can see what they do in terms of being able to unwrap it and put it down the trachea and things along those lines. But now being able to actually have a reaction from the patient, unlock that next level of the simulation experience where now, again, if they had a family member there, or the, now they have to explain to the patient, I'm so sorry I was sectioned down too deep and I hit your correct, like you know, explain that whole process to them. Again, I think that it's just, that's the coolest part is that again, it, it, it not only adds this cool element and piece of technology, but it unlocks that next level of the simulation experience. Yeah, and we actually did research mm -hmm. that, uh, that's, that same semester. We, we did research <clears throat> and we observed the nursing student interaction. We compared it with a mannequin um, that blinks and you know has mm -hmm. a heartbeat and everything. We compared the suctioning and interaction for that particular patient versus the patient wearing the prototype of the current AV trait. Mm -hmm. And the other really important piece to this, we found lots of things. Much more likely to explain procedures, much more likely to offer reassurance, much more likely to ask questions or explain things mm -hmm. to the patient. But this, it was six times, they were six times more likely to pay attention to patient safety concerns. Mm. So if they forgot to use hand sanitizer or wash their hands, they would, they would self-recognize those errors, any breaks in sterile technique. They self-recognized, and that's published. That's published mm -hmm. in a journal. It's pu published in clinical simulation and nursing. But the the part that didn't get published was that we also did focus groups. Mm -hmm. And when I found out that these statistics, I asked the nursing students, "What made you recognize that uh, you know you had broken a sterile technique or that you needed to wash your hands?" And they said, "We just ha knew that that." There was a person in that room, mm -hmm. and we felt as the we felt more strongly that we needed to pay attention to our sterile technique. One because they thought that the patient knew if they were doing the procedure correctly, which is kind of funny because they, they didn't. No idea. <laughs> um, but two because it was an actual person, mm -hmm. and I think to me again that wasn't ever published, but it, it, it was part of the focus group. Um, it just. It, it, it's as if all of the pieces of the puzzle came together yeah. for this particular patient. Yeah. Um, and I just knew that this was so important, not just to me, but to other healthcare care educators. I, yeah. I felt as though we really needed to try to get the word out about what we were doing yeah. um, and how important it was. in what world do you have engineers, nursing, and theater collaborating on a project yep. For the betterment of healthcare education, right? Again, like those those three departments don't usually hang yeah. out or spend no, a lot of time no, together. Not even yeah. a little bit. Not even a little bit. So at this point, did you feel like this is the million dollar idea? Like this is the oh. we're gonna we're gonna start the company now. We're gonna No, you know. absolutely not. I loved it. 
I knew it made a difference. Mm-hmm. I felt as though this needs, like, we need to let other people know about it. Um, we approached, so not me personally, but um, the university, because this be- technology belonged to the university at yeah. the time. It still does, but um, it's licensed to Avkin now. But the, the university reached out to several different companies within the simulation space to ask them if they were interested in licensing the technology. Um, and I was just sure that one of the major players in simulation was going to take this and run with it. Like, yeah. Because I could see it as an educator. I couldn't imagine. I know now it's a, it's a lot more work yeah. than just yeah. creating a Having prototype. Having the idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 But at the time, I was like, it, for sure, somebody else is going to want to pick this up. Mm-hmm. We actually had some of the major players come to the university and see what we were doing and talk to see us our- about it. Bubble gum and glue yes. together. Well, it was a little bit nicer at that point. We've gotten some <laughs> molds and things, but if you know, it definitely was still a very much of a infancy concept yeah. or idea. Um, and they didn't bite, mm-hmm. and I was shocked. Mm-hmm. I literally was shocked. I didn't understand, mm-hmm. and so my thought was, well, let me enter it into a poster at IMSH, which is mm-hmm. International Meeting on Simulation and Healthcare. It's the what largest. Year was that? Uh, we, we we entered for 2016. So we entered, mm-hmm. we sent the application in for a poster in 2015. Yeah. 2016 is when we were accepted. Because it's January. Yeah, so it was January, like January right. 2016. Yeah. Yeah. And so the idea was, hey, we got to we gotta do something here. Yeah. So um, Amy Buka and I entered the poster, a mm-hmm. poster. And and just to clarify, at the time, Amy Buka was our sim tech at the university. Yes. Mm-hmm. She was our sim tech and our engineering liaison. Because yeah. we were, again, making more things, right? Yeah. We were beginning the Avcaf and the Avstick. Mm-hmm. Um, and a few other products that we haven't made yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so the, we, we entered the, the poster and uh, to, to, you know, display at IMSH. For and innovation and technology. No, I had no idea. Oh. I just was entering a poster oh, to okay. be able to show other people to get their feedback because I thought if I can prove that other people in the simulation world see value in um, what we were doing, that we could convince one of these companies to take the technology. I had zero aspirations yeah. um, of starting It was just company. to get more hype, just to get more excitement around it, or to let people know what we were doing. It was to validate my claims. Okay. I would say that. <laughs> I would say it was definitely to validate my claims. I felt very strongly that other people in the simulation world would think this was really, really exciting. Yeah. So we entered the poster mm-hmm. application, and in October of 2015, I'll never forget it, I was sitting there and I opened the email and they said, congratulations, you have been selected as a poster presenter. Um, you have won first fu- first prize for technology and innovation. And at that point, I had no idea we had entered any competition or that there was mm-hmm. any evaluation. But the fact that we had won first prize at IMSH. Now, again, at the time, I had never been to IMSH. Mm-hmm. I hadn't even been to an Axel, I don't think, at, yeah. that, at that point. No I, funding. No funding, <laughs> right. Yeah, my professional development budget was 500. Yeah. So I had never been to any of the major players. But the fact that I, our poster was was accepted, we did have grant money to go, so mm-hmm. I knew that we would be able to go. And it was just to me that I had arrived. Yeah. That this was, this was we were in the big, we were in the big, world now like big boys club or whatever you want to say I just I never I I don't know it was just a huge compliment yeah not just to be accepted as a poster but now we had won first prize we I was being judged by my peers by very Mm -hmm. you know I don't know not affluent not that's not the right word but people that were very well respected in the simulation industry. Yeah, the pioneers the of, yeah. Susie mm-hmm. cardang Egren was one of, yeah. the, one of the people that judged this. And, and so from my perspective, I was just like, this is, this is it. I'm mm-hmm. going to go to, we're going to go to IMSH. We're going to demonstrate this. We're going to show put our poster up. Do. And we had this the This is where I enter the conversation <laughs> here too. Because I got to go to IMSH. Yeah. And we had the option to have a table mm-hmm. at, at our poster. Mm-hmm. And my concept was fantastic. We're gonna demo we're gonna demo this at, at the time it wasn't called Avtrake, but this this yeah, our tricky ask me overlay yeah. or we're gonna demo it there <laughs> on this table. I mean it was it made again, I'm an ER nurse, so probably not the safest thing in the world, but <laughs> OSHA so was, was so not at <laughs> this conference. <laughs> so we went to the to the um, conference, and it was uh, there was five of us that yeah. that got to go with the with the grant money, and um, we we'll put a picture up. For we YouTubers. we borrowed 
we borrowed several pillows from the hotel room to yes. be able to prop up our tracheostomy patient at a yeah. 45 degree angle. For ju- just a regular old table too. Just to be very clear. Yes. Like no, it like was just like a straight table. up table. And then we just grabbed enough pillows and put them in suitcases and brought them across the street to the conference. We, we took them back. We took, we them, took back. them back. <laughs> but enough pillows to support a person to be on the bed. Well, it was so that bed. we could suction on the table. On the table. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So that me, as a non-nurse, could suction. And I remember standing in front of that poster and you teaching me how to suction as people are there watching what we're doing. Yes. So it was, it was, I think it was a two hour poster presentation time. Yeah. Right. And the whole concept behind it was, okay, we have two hours to demonstrate this. Let's get as many people excited as, as, as possible about what we were doing. And to my surprise, several people came by. Yeah. Right. I mean, it was a lot of people and yeah. people kept saying, where can we get one of these? Where can we get one of these? I'm yeah. like, oh, we could so, we could have sold a lot of yeah. these. Like, yeah. you know, so one of these mannequin companies is going to see how much traction we're getting. And they're def- like, we'll be holding court over in, you know, some office space Because they're going to see how many people want these. Absolutely. Yeah. I mm-hmm. just knew it. I knew for sure that that was going to happen. Um, but that didn't happen. Yeah. And so, all right, okay, next, next thing we get to do is present for 15 minutes. Mm-hmm. And this was basically the top five... Um, winners. Yeah. Prizes, innovation technology. Right. Innovation yeah. technology pr- numbers one through five. It was an hour and a half long, so they gave, you know, switch yeah. around time. But uh, we got to that small room, and there were several representatives there from different mannequin companies, and I thought, okay. Time to shine. This is it. Here this we is go. It. Um, but we sat in a row together, the I five remember. of us. I remember that. And they called up number five, and they called up number four, and they, again, great ideas. And then they called up number three, and number three was Harvard, Harvard University. And I remember I was literally coming out of my Flopping seat. Flopping like a chicken. <laughs> well, no, I didn't, not on the outside. On the inside, I was like, oh, we beat Harvard. I remember you hitting my knee at one oh, point. Oh, really? So, really? Maybe. I mean, I don't think I it was as, a little. I don't think it was as inside as you think it was. Um, but I was like, we beat Harvard. And when the guy came up to present, again, a really cool concept of what yeah. he had. I still um, remember the concept. It was a great idea. Yeah, it was a great idea. But he was a Harvard paid biomedical engineer. Not a student, an actual biomedical engineer that worked in their simulation space to create a solution for a problem that they had. And I remember thinking to myself, oh, my gosh. Like, this is it. We we beat Harvard. How could that possibly be? Mm-hmm. Our senior engineering students mm-hmm. beat a paid Harvard engineer. And, again, no knock on Harvard. Their yeah. concept was great, but it was just. But we did beat them. So, like, let's just well, okay. be clear. But we but, did. But it just was such an honor. Yeah. Again. And so I was riding high. Mm-hmm. I was really excited. We went up and did the presentation. Oh, who was number two? I don't know. Yale. <laughs> no. Yes. yes. Were they? Yes. Oh, my gosh. Yale I, I I've forgotten two. all about that. So, okay. I don't remember what they made. I'm sorry, Yale. Um, but once we got our presentation done, again, holding court. I'll, I got my business cards ready. <laughs> Whenever you're ready, to give me a call. Who wants to start putting numbers up? We'll start the auction right now. Let's uh, I just give knew. I was sure that they would see the value in what we were doing. Well, I remember after that presentation, we had someone, so sorry, do not know who it was. I remember we had someone who came up and she said, you need to let me know the moment I can buy these. And I remember saying, how much do they cost? And us being like, um, <laughs> mm, yes, about that. We will get back to you. It was but like a, that one I remember. It was Oxford University. Oh, was it? Okay. It was and Oxford. I just remember mm-hmm. we had no concept of that. Like, still for us, it was just like, we're glad you want it. Like, we're glad that you're excited right. about it. Because right. again, we Can had. You go no, tell those guys over there? Cause. Yeah, because we had no. I mean, again, at that point, like, business or us starting a business was just not even on the radar still yes. at this point. But it is soon to come. Yes. It is soon to come. Continue. Same Continue. same conference. Yeah. Again, I was expecting that night to get several phone calls. <laughs> Waiting by the phone. <laughs> Waiting by the phone. <laughs> Nothing happened. Yeah, crickets. Literally crickets was happening. So we went to um, we went to the exhibit hall. Again, we weren't we weren't exhibiting at the time. Yeah. Obviously, we had just poster presentations. But I remember going to the exhibit hall and talking to one of those major companies. And um, I knew one of them because his daughter had gone to nursing school 
um, at the university that I worked at. Mm -hmm. And so I walked up to him, and he was in a group of about three or four people. And again, these were very... The people. The people. You talked to. The people. And I said, hey, just so you know. I remember this like it was yesterday. I still remember this so clearly. Just so you know. (laughs) We could have sold 75 of these. Here's my phone number if you want to give me a call. No, I didn't say that. I said we could have sold 75 of these if, out of the back of a truck if, at this conference if we if we had had them. Like, yes. are, like, are you not interested? And not the person that I knew, but one of the other people in the group looked at me with a dead face and said, well, then go do it. And I remember thinking to myself... <laughs> You said the wrong thing. I remember that moment of me, and I remember him saying that, and I just remember looking at you like, "He didn't I'm say gonna that. Start, I'm going to start this company. I will start this company myself. You don't do it. I'm starting it. Because someone is doing this based off of that just taunt right there. Yes. Here but we I go. But I was still scared to death. No, I, I mean, of course, of course. But I, it's kind of one of those moments like, I had no idea at the time how big it was. You know what I mean? Like, again, at that point, I was still just doing the SP education. I just was still so, like, you know, again, like, God, I think how you were maybe a few months earlier, but just more like, it's a cool idea. This is awesome. But in that moment was the moment that I remember feeling like, oh, it's game time. Like, here we go. Like, kind of like, this is no longer just a... Well, I think partially because you're my daughter, you know, yes. <laughs> you know that when that kind of thing comes, it's like, all right. It was one of those like, <laughs> I'm sorry, what'd you just say to her? Like, <laughs> it was a little bit of that moment of, you don't know what you just did. Like, you <laughs> don't know what well, you I, just I, did. You know, honestly, like, we didn't know what we just we did. We had no idea. I mean, no. and again, you also have no idea what goes into it. And Again, I think on the other side of it, you can clearly see now someone who has the concept of a prototype, but you have no market discovery. You have no nothing, right? You just have someone coming up to you saying, I have this really cool idea. A lot of people are interested. They love it. You have no pricing. You have no cogs. You have no, you, you have no business plan, right? And being like, do you want to buy it? Like right. now, it obviously, like it is. It, you look at it and it really is like, they're not, they're not ready. But- at the time, the passion to get it out there was just so strong yeah. that I think it was that realization that nobody was calling you. Like nobody nope. was the one nope. that was going to give I you was that not phone call. Court. No, no one, no one was bidding <laughs> was over not it. And holding so, court. Yeah. yeah, it's kind of like when you see your baby and you know that you love your baby, yeah. right? But no one else loves your baby yeah. the way you. And, love and your at baby. that conference, I went to a leadership. Um, it was a panel presentation. Mm -hmm. And I remember going up to Ian Cohen, who was one of the panelists, and I said, I don't understand why nobody wants this. Mm -hmm. And he drew a graph, um, you know, just a a simple graph, and he said, Amy, the amount of technology that people want in the products is here. And he pointed, you know, kind of in that down lower corner, and he said, and that's where your product is. He said, the amount of technology that is in those mannequins is here. And he pointed in the upper corner. Mm -hmm. And he said, if they take on your product and your concept, they're not going to sell their mannequins. Mm -hmm. He said, what they might do is license the technology from the university and put it on a shelf so that nobody ever sees it. Because it is a competition. And for the first time, I realized, for the first time, I thought, oh, this could not get out. Yeah. This and and it was so to me. I was so passionate that this was the better way. And and, and at that point, we were working on other products, and I could yeah. see the value. Um, the students could, were telling me the value, mm-hmm. and it was like, oh no, mm-hmm. that we, we're we got to do this now. Again, I still was like, I was definitely on very shaky ground, chicken legs. <laughs> I you know very nervous. And I can remember walking out, it was me, you, and Amy Buka, and saying, well, do we do this? I don't know. No, I can wasn't we? there for that. Oh, you I wasn't weren't? there for that. No. I define that moment as the DTR walk of you and Amy Buka, the define the relationship walk. <laughs> but that was the, like, big moment for you. I wasn't there for that. I heard about it. I heard about the moment, the 
the moment it happened, but I, I was not a part oh, of that. Oh, I thought that you was were just, there with no, us. That was just the two of you guys just... Well, we were walking out of the exhibit hall. Yeah, I, I wasn't there. I wasn't there for but that. But we were walking out of the exhibit hall, and I'm like, I just don't know. I don't know if we have a, what it takes to start a company. And she's like, I think we can do it. I think we can start it. And I was like, well, if Amy Buka says it, <laughs> then we can do it, you know? And that is the rule, honestly. It's but, what but, would Amy do is really how we live our well, lives and here. And really, honestly, like looking back on that, she was the engineering mind, yeah. right? So I couldn't, like I had all the passion. Yeah. I had all, I could I could envision what, what was needed in the industry, but I had no ability to get it from my head to my hands. Yeah. Whereas she, she could see those steps. And and she says now she's like I don't know why you believe me, but <laughs> but it was the, it was the idea that we had somebody from the technological perspective, yeah. and and she believed in enough in what yeah. we were doing that she was willing to put herself out there too. And Amy is more naturally reserved as is, so yes. the fact that for her yes. she's not going to be as emotionally influenced by things like that. So for her to just be able to be logical and say, yeah, yeah. I think we can, I think yeah. we can do this. So, so that's another situation where I was ready to achieve radical change, but I felt like my hands were tied. Yeah. I didn't know how we were going to get the financing. Yeah. I didn't know how we were going to get from where we were to where we needed to be. I didn't even know if we like, know. Google, how to start a company. <laughs> it happened. I definitely <laughs> did that a time or two. But we were able to get grant funding through the university. We were able to then really test our be I guess the best way to put it is to be incubated within the yeah. university and then really take a step out. So we had our pricing modeled down before we we knew what the price would be after mm -hmm. we got through I guess it was about another year. Mm -hmm. Um and you know from from the perspective of you know the what what did I do when I was trying to achieve this radical change is networking, mm -hmm. right? Of, not just me, it's not just my expertise, it's not just what I know, but it's also who who else around me can help mm -hmm. with achieving this, who else can, you know, go shoulder to shoulder with me and believe in this partnership. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, so I always look back on those times, those really key moments uh, before we actually officially started the company as to how... What empowered us to get from where we want, where we were, mm -hmm. to where we needed to be to make that radical change? Yeah. The other thing that I hear consistently too is that you're faced with a problem, you're faced with a barrier that's in front of you, and rather than saying, "Oh, there's a barrier here, we can't get past that," right? It's you went beyond that and pushed past that barrier. It was okay. So what's the solution? Am I going to go over it? Am I going to go under it? Am I going to go around it? But here we go. Because we're going to go past it. So what's that going to be? And I think that that happens so often where, you know, we feel underqualified. We don't feel like, oh, there's that barrier there. That's there for a reason. Now let me back off, right? Or, oh, that would be really nice. Or someone should, right? It's always that concept of, am I the one that's going to be the one to bring this forward? And I think that that's the really exciting part is looking at this story. And again, there's so many times where it's like you looked at it and it was like, well, you know what? We're going to do it. We might be scared, but we're going to do it scared, right? I love that quote. I think that's amazing. But again, moving forward with that concept of do it scared, keep moving forward because someone has to be the one to bring it, right? Because if not, it's just a really cool idea that somebody had once and sits on a shelf. Well, it's funny that you bring up that whole do it scared thing because as I was going through this journey, and Megan can remember this very clearly. Very clearly. I, I exactly would read going. books and books and books. I, I read and listened to over 250 books on starting a company, 250 books on women in leadership. And her personality would change with every book that she read. <laughs> She'd have a different theme depending on the book she was so reading. So this one is a consistent theme. Yes. Though. No, this, it is. This one This one lasted yep. for a little bit. So, well, it still does to this day <laughs> because, because there's still times where you do feel that fear. Um, but what was explained to me in, in the book Playing Big by Tara Moore um, is that there is two words for fear in Hebrew. One is fear of, you know, I'm in a dark alley and there's someone following me. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember that fear. I don't mm -hmm. remember the name of it. But it is like actual fear for yeah. your own safety, mm -hmm. right? And then there is yura. And yura is actually, it creates the same physical or somatic symptoms. But it is that you're entering into something bigger than you are. Mm -hmm. Entering into something that is 
bigger than you ever ex- imagined. Mm-hmm. And so each of those times that I described to you are kind of your raw moments. And at the yeah. time, I didn't know it for the first two. For the last one, I was getting there with, yeah. with getting myself, okay, I got to figure out what to do. But but that going into it afraid is be, is embracing those feelings and going, I don't know that I'm necessarily the most qualified for this, but by golly, I'm just as qualified as the next person, and yeah. I can figure it out. And yeah. I don't, I'm not figuring it out by myself. I'm figuring out with a team of people. Mm-hmm. And as we have grown this company now to over 38 employees, I am so excited to see that everyone works shoulder to shoulder. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, I think that that's just – that's our culture is that mm-hmm. – interdepartmentally we work together and again it's kind of like a big giant family we don't always love each other but at the end of the day you know we we really are passionate about what's what we're doing Mm -hmm. and we see the value all the way down to the people that are manufacturing these products and shipping them out they Mm -hmm. understand the importance of how these products can improve healthcare outcomes yeah and i think another big part of it too just from thinking about where we went from you know, IMSH, and then moving forward to actually becoming like an established company, that also was just hard work. Like a lot of it was just put your head down and work. And I remember through the grant, we went through and went to so many conferences. We visited so many places. We did so much just in terms of getting the word out there. And I do think that there's also that element of you can dream, you can have passion, but then you've got to also have that put your head down and work for that first bit to get it up off the floor. Because again, it was no easy feat to go from concept. It never is easy, but I do think that now have it where we are size wise and things like that. It's a different kind of hard. I think that's, I think that's the best way of putting it. It's at Mm -hmm. that time it was, you just, we just need to be everywhere. We are still working on the prototypes for the Avcath and the Av stick at the time. I mean, again, that was a, bang your head against the wall moment too and all the way around we were just trying to get those things working those things out plus building up a team plus getting the word out and at the time we didn't know but we were doing marketing we were doing market discovery we were testing this model we were going out there yeah we learned where we shouldn't go we learned where we shouldn't go (laughs) but we also got those really big glimmers of hope of Mm -hmm. seeing people who were believing in us right absolutely and again at the time I think that we really didn't know but I think it was really exciting to be able to have yeah. Those those glimmers of hope as we went. And again, it's that slow, per, you know, we're well, literally just saying this, not recording, but it was like you, the further you go, it's still scary, right? It's still the fact of you're still working as hard as you're working. You're still trying to get it down and you're still every step of the way trying to figure out how to build this company the way that it needs to be built. And again, it's all unknown, right? It's all taking steps. But all of like, that is because we're so passionate and we yeah, care so much. And we absolutely. want to see it's every success. Yeah. So I think that that, again, that, that's what it goes back to. You, you definitely get more confidence. Yeah. You know, I can remember doing the financials for the first time <laughs> and literally having no idea what I was doing. I remember sitting down with Amy Book at one point and she's like, financials are a joke. You can make them say whatever you want them to say. <laughs> She's like, what do you want this to say? Because I could just, I can make it say whatever you want. She's like, ah. That was probably about a year ago. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> but like, we're better. We're, we're better. Like we have a lot of projections. This is just how business is, but, but, but again, it's, it's, it's not nearly as scary because yeah. it is something that we've done so much. We're starting to have data and trends. And it's just, again, it's, you. but, but for me, the true, like, creme de la creme is going to a conference, demonstrating our products, and seeing the look on people's faces that see yeah. the products for the first being time. Being with our people. You say that uh, all the time. But it's uh, like being with our people. Nothing Going better. back. It always feels like going home, which I think is always super awesome to see the same people, see the people that believed in you, and see the people who believed in us early on. Like there are some people, again, buying our beta testing products mm-hmm. in those early days that, again, it was like we were we had our sales team, so at the time, two part-time sales team, and they were selling things that we didn't even have photos of. People were buying these without even having a picture of what they were yeah. buying. Yeah. And again, they it's saw it not, though. They did see it at a conference or a demonstration or something. Not Avcath and not Avstick. We were no, still figuring true. it yeah. out. So again, it was like they didn't even have a photo of what that was going to look like. And the sales team were able to sell that because I do think that it just showed how much of a need there was in the industry. Yeah. Which is yeah. awesome. All right. So to wrap up this episode of Simulation Nation, we are going to do... 60 second question. So I know that you are not a woman of few words, but we are going to force you to be for this section. Good luck. I need a timer. 
All right. So. I don't know if I'm going to like this one. This is rapid fire questions. I'm going to cut you off. All right. So we have the timer for 10 seconds. So I'm going to ask you a question. You have to answer it within 10 seconds. Okay. And we're going to ask you six questions. All right. All right. You ready? Mm -hmm. Okay. What is one expected lesson that you've learned? One expected or unexpected? Unexpected. One unexpected lesson. It's a lot harder than you think. And it takes twice as long. All right. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Next question. Um, moment in time that stands out to you. Oh, I just talked about it. The trach simulation, the CPR simulation, and the situation where we were in the exhibit hall and we were told to start our own company. All right. Next. What do you wish people knew about starting a company? I just said that. Oh, I already asked that question. <laughs> no, you said the unexpected lesson. Oh. I was referring to starting a company. It takes twice as long, and it's really hard. Okay. Um, what would your advice be for a simulationist that feels like they have their hands tied? Find people within your network or within your maybe your secondary or tertiary network that can help you. What would you go back and tell yourself? in 2014? That you're a lot smarter and a lot more capable than you think you are. Mm. What would be your number one resource for a simulationist? Ooh, for simulationist? I think defining, or excellent, defining excellence in simulation, um, I think that book is amazing. <coughs> we do have a chapter in that book. All right, those are all the questions I have. Great. All right, everybody, thank you for joining us on Simulation Nation podcast. We appreciate you listening. Tune in next week for another episode to learn more.